All right. Uh, in phase <clears throat> four tonight, we told you when we started looking at this that we were going to take this chunk of material found uh, in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 that only Mark gives us that comes, that's what it, the body of material is called the upper room discourse. It, it comes in the aftermath of Judas leaving the upper room as they were gathered there for that, for that last Passover which Jesus took and transformed into uh, the new covenant meal we would call the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, Eucharist. That when Judas leaves, then Jesus teaches this body of material, this, this deep searching. And then in John 17, he prays. After this, uh, there is the arrest. And we've, so we've already looked at that on Sunday mornings in Mark. So uh, what we'll do next week, Lord willing, is we'll, we'll sort of tie this this idea of disciple making, following Jesus day by day as disciples who want to be disciple makers, who make disciple makers, we'll tie all that together next Sunday, Lord willing. And then the following Sunday, we will uh, watch the video, the, the simulcast, not video, simulcast of the insanity of God, which is about missionaries who, who go and encounter persecuted Christians. It's, it's a fascinating, fascinating movie. So tonight, let's look at John 17. I want to ask you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 1 to 4 initially, and then we're going to dive into to the whole, uh, just work our way through these 26 verses tonight. Stand with me, if you would, as I read from John 17, 1 through 4, often called the high priestly prayer. When Jesus had spoken these words, now remember what he spoke. Trouble in this world, be good cheer, I've overcome the world. When he'd spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. This is what is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. I, I want you to just focus in on verse 4 before we launch into this whole chapter study tonight. Thank you. Please be seated. If we were to diagram verse 4, I glorified you. It's a past tense. Where? On earth. How? Having accomplished, finished, completed the work that you gave me to do. I glorified, past tense, you. Now, if you read commentaries, and, and I, I'm not being critical because I think there's certainly some truth here, you're going to see people that I regard highly say, what he's doing here is he's praying about what he's about to do on the cross. Well, that certainly is, is in view. You could not suggest that, he, that that's not on the horizon for him. But he prays that from the cross. John 19, 30, he prays, it is finished. And we've looked at that through the years when we've had occasion to, and I would just remind you briefly that when Jesus prays, it is finished. What's recorded in our English versions, it is finished. It is one Greek word. It's a four-syllable, tetelestai, and it, and it means it has been accomplished. He's hanging on the tree. He has... He has endured, in that, in that time of darkness, he has endured the wrath of God poured out upon sin. And he has accomplished salvation. And we would recognize that. He's gone through the ordeal of the cross. He's about to give up his spirit to die and, and be buried and then raised three days later. It has been accomplished. That's what he says on the cross. And I think to be, just to be honest, exegetes, to be someone who is simply honest with the Scripture, let the Scripture speak, that we need to come to this verse, I glorified you on earth, 
having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, that we need to ask ourselves, to what does he have reference? He's referring to something. He's not so much anticipating something. He is referring to something. It's interesting. Two different words are used here, by the way. Tetelestai, it puts the emphasis on, from, a, from a term on a finish. This particular word, though they're pretty close, if you were to look at the Greek, they they're, they're sort of share some commonalities. But this word has a, has a distinctive about finishing the goal, completing the design. And that's critical to me, I think. Because what I believe he's teaching here is that having had these 12 with him for three years or so, having allowed one of them to leave the room, and then he pours into them this body of teaching, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16 of John, he has now finished. He has completed the bulk of his training. He is now ready to go to the cross, and it will not be premature for him to do that. Having accomplished the work. Yes, his primary work was to live a sinless life, to die in the fullness of time, a, a, the painful, shameful death of the cross, hanging, suspended, cursed as anyone who hangs on the tree, Deuteronomy taught, hanging, suspended on the cross, Representing man to God, representing God to man. Accomplishing redemption. He didn't make redemption possible there. He doesn't say that when he cries out on the cross. It has been accomplished. He accomplishes redemption. He has made divine satisfaction for the wrath of God. By his suffering and death in our place. Doing that. He's also done something else. He has equipped the 11 to carry on the work and assured them, as we looked at last week, assured them that it was expedient, it was necessary, it was beneficial for him to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come and not so much them physically following Jesus around anymore, but the Holy Spirit coming to dwell within each one, leading them to accomplish the mission. That's what I want you to see tonight. So the high priestly prayer is prayed by a Savior who is convinced that he has equipped these 11 to carry out the work. He, as a disciple maker, has made these 11 disciples who will be disciple makers as well. Was his uh, confidence unwarranted? Well, if we were short-sighted and we simply saw the next few hours, we would think so. Because they fled, they hid, they seemed to abandon him. I mean, as soon as you finish this, this chapter 17, in, verse, in chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these things, he went out to the, to the brook Kidron. He crosses over into Gethsemane, and he's arrested there, and they all flee. If, if you're short-sighted, if you have a short perspective, boy, what a, what a misplaced confidence. But if you begin to look beyond that and you look beyond the resurrection and you look to Pentecost and then beyond Pentecost, you see that it was very, very definitely warranted. He was exactly right. He had equipped them. And then he gave them the final piece of the puzzle, the Holy Spirit. And I said to you last week, I want to mention again, that we have the Holy Spirit. Several of us have been believers much longer than three years. In fact, I'm going to submit to you that the Holy Spirit dwelling in the person accelerates the growth. Because when Paul plants churches in the book of Acts, just, just think about this when you read back through. It's not as if years and years and years pass. He comes into a situation. He plants a church. He sends Titus or Timothy back through. says, appoint elders. Well, these, these believers have not been believers of an incredibly long amount of time. So the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the work of the gospel and advancing the kingdom accelerates growth. We have that as well. We have all we need. That's what, I want, that's what I'm trying to tell you. We have all we need to be disciple makers. All right, so let's look at the, the passage now with just that little bit of a background behind you. 
Look at chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 1 to 3. When Jesus had spoken these things, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. So now, they've had the Lord's Supper. He's taught them this body of material after he washed their feet. Now he prays. Now they, they got to get in on a lot of his prayer life in the three years there. Not all of it. Sometimes he would draw aside by himself. But they got to, we, don't, we didn't get to do that. But we see this here. And this is, this is such a window into how Jesus prayed. And it teaches us how to pray. And it also encourages us because of how, of how he prays. Father, remember that's blasphemy unless God is his father. <laughs> That's blasphemy to call God Father. That's what they char would charge you with later on. Father, the hour has come. Now he's talking about being handed over to sinners who will abuse him, put him to death. The hour has come. Glorify your Son. Purpose clause here. In order that the Son may glorify you. The idea of glorifying, remember, is to set forth as, as altogether lovely and worthy and glorious and precious and valuable. He says, Father, do that for me. And again, this, this language, looking back through the, what we look back through, may seem like strange language because what happens to him in the next few hours seems like anything but glory until you, until you look with the eye of faith at what he's doing. He glorifies his son. How does he do that? By honoring his sinless life and acknowledging that he is the fit substitute to bear the sin of his people. Glorify your son. That the son may glorify you. How does he glorify the father? Well, he's been, he's been glorifying him by being perfectly obedient. Now he's, the, the old writers talked about the active and passive righteousness of Jesus Christ. His active righteousness is a life of, of perfect obedience to the law. His passive righteousness is his, his willingly surrendering, being given over to people who are going to be despicable, unspeakable things to him. Glorify me. That I may glorify you by how I embrace this. Since... In other words, the, the idea of the Son glorifying the Father and the Father glorifying the Son is because you have given Him authority over all flesh. Again, strangely ironic terms for a man who's about to, to be, allow himself to be handed over to flesh, to criminal, corrupt, wicked, hateful flesh. You've given Him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given Him. One writer commented, there are many mysteries and marvels when you gaze upon the cross. One of them being knowing that Jesus hung there fully capable of coming down at any moment. Fully capable of with a look laying waste to and slaughtering everyone in that crowd that had anything to do with putting him there. Or look up to heaven, and heaven would have emptied of its angels to come and min and minister to him. The devil was speaking the truth in in the in the wilderness uh, temptations when he said he's given his angels charge over you. Jump off the building; they they'll catch you. They won't let you be hurt. All they had to do was look, and the angels peering into that would have emptied heaven to come and rescue. Him. That's one of the amazing marvels of the cross. He's Jesus has authority over all flesh. And he uses this authority not selfishly, but to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And then what is eternal life? Well, we know it's a quality of life. We know that, that when you're saved by grace through faith here on this planet, that, that you, you undertake, undergo a quality of life transformation where now you are, you're living with a, with a soul uh, that not only will never die, but a soul that has been destined to be in glory. It will, it will be transported to heaven. And at the resurrection, your body reunited with him. And then, so there's eternity ahead of you, but there's, there's eternal life. It's a quality of life. It's a different quality. This is eternal life that, that they know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is, this is the tangible evidence. Here's the deal. How does someone, how can a person say, well, I, I, t I touched you and I realize you have eternal life. No, you can't do it. It's not that tangible. But the evidence that a person possesses eternal life is that they know God, not just know about God. There's a difference. I've encountered scores of people through the years when I've been witnessing who give me this very general American nonsense. Well, I believe in God and all that stuff. So I just got to where I would ask him, what stuff? You know, most people don't have an answer for that. What stuff? That they may know you. Remember, that was Paul's magnificent obsession in Philippians. I want to know him. Well, wait a minute, Paul, you're, you're the author of half the New Testament. Don't you know him? I want to know him. I want, I want to increasingly, intentionally, more deeply know him. And in Jesus Christ. Not just know about them, but know. And remember, you go back to Genesis and you read this language in Genesis. And Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son. The idea, in, when you're talking about knowing God, you're talking about having an intimate, personal relationship with God. And here he, he desires that. And then he says in verse 4, I glorified you on earth. We're going to look now at a little different section. I glorified you on earth, verses 4 to 8, <clears throat> having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me. Now, let's, let's just back up a minute. Look at this. Father, the hour has come, verse 1. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work. And he comes back to this. Verse 4, I glorified you on earth. So this, this, is, a, this is something that's in his mind here. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Writers ponder what he's talking about here. We certainly saw a snapshot of that when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were there, and after, after Jesus had communed with Moses and Elijah, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, he took on a, a Shekinah appearance. What he's talking about here, I think, now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. In other words, Lord, make it, God, make it obvious that you and I are one. Make it obvious that you love me and that I love you and that, that you approve of me. Because, you see, what Jesus is about to go through... <clears throat> The biblical implications of being crucified were that you were cursed by God. Isaiah 53, we did, we did esteem him smitten by God. And that's true. But Jesus is praying here, help, help them with the eyes of faith to see that you have not so much judged me as an end in itself. In other words, punished me for some displeasure you have in me, but that you've punished me because I am bearing their sin. You've punished me in order to forgive them. Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Show them somehow that when you spoke at the baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Or when at the, at the transfiguration, this is my son, listen to him. Or at the ascension. Show them that you're pleased with me. Verse 6, I have manifested your name. In other words, I've made known, I've, I've disclosed your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Clearly he's talking about uh, the 11, 12, if you understand what he said earlier, that uh, uh, have I not chosen you, the 12, and one of you is the devil. Jesus has handpicked these men because he understands that God had given them to him. 
Yours they were. God sent his son into the world to recover, to seek and to save that which was lost, Jesus said in Luke 19.10. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. In other words, I've taught them the importance of obeying, of treasuring your word. And now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. And this is one of the comments one of the disciples makes that we've looked at recently. We now, now we know that you are from God and everything you speak is from God. For I have given them the words that you gave me. He's already taught earlier. I don't say anything except the Father gives it to me to say. I've given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to know in truth. So here's the difference. It's not just notional. It's not just an idea. Well, yeah, I, I, I kind of don't know. It's that they've come to know in truth. The truth has gripped them. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. He has said it earlier in John's gospel. If you continue in my word, you're really my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They, they have come to know in truth that I came from you. There's, others don't see it. There's a group of guys on the way to the garden here in a little while who think he's a blasphemer and a heretic. They see it, and they have believed that you sent me. It's one of the goals, by the way, of our ministry, for people to see how we love him and love one another. Hereby will all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. They believe that you sent me. So this idea of, of God glorifying him. And then he... Then as he's praying, we get in on what he's praying, some of the things he's praying specifically for concerning his people. Look at verse 9. We want to see verses 9 and 10 here. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. That's astounding. He could have said, I'm praying for them. But he makes this distinction. And how are we to understand this? Well, if somebody has said that, that while God loves every human being, every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve, as creatures, he's the creator, as creatures made in his, his image, he loves his children as a father. You see, there's a, there's a love of God that's a creator love. As the creator, he loves his creatures. But there is a love of God that's a fatherly love. And you, you could think about it this way, if you have children. You probably love children generally, but you love your children in a way that you don't love other children. That's what we're talking about. I'm praying for them. He prays for his own, those who've been given to him, in a way that he does not pray for the world. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And we went through this covenant study years ago. I told you, when you look at this language, those whom you have given, given by the Father, he's talking about this covenant, the eternal covenant. Hebrews talks about at the close of it, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, or the eternal covenant. In eternity past, the Father, Son, and Spirit in communion with each other, the Father purposed to set his heart upon a people to save them. The Son pledged to go to this people, keep the whole law perfectly, not sinning at one point, the fullness of time dying at the hand of God, having God pour out his wrath upon the Son, that these people would have their sins forgiven, that the Spirit promised to come and apply this purpose of the Father and this pledge of the Son to everyone for whom it was in intended. They're yours. All mine are yours, he says, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Just think about that for a minute. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've been saved by grace through faith, he is glorified in you. That is staggering. In verse 11 and 12, and I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Now he is speaking in terms of, of how, how set and determined this is. There's no backing out. Remember now, he says this before he prays in Gethsemane. 
So anybody that would look at the prayer in Gethsemane and think, well, he's having a, he's having a crisis of conscience here. He's having second thoughts. No, no. He's struggling with the weight of what's about to happen to him. But here, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. In other words, by, by the name of God, not just identify with his name, but keep them by the power that is your name. Jesus would cast out demons. It was his name, who he was, that caused them to shriek. Keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. He prays for their unity. It's one of those things that as you read through this and other you, you think, no, we don't we don't treasure unity as we ought. We we are too quick to fuss and fight them. And yet for Jesus it was critical. It's critical. Keep them in your name. What's one of the evidences that we're being kept in the Father's name? That we strive to be one, even as the Father and the Son are one. While I was with them, verse 12, I kept them in your name. In other words, I, I manifested my power. And he did. They, they, nobody could lay a hand. Isn't it amazing? Think about this. That these 12 people followed him around for three years. There were several attempts on Jesus' life that failed miserably. And yet, as far as we know from the biblical record, no one ever made an attempt on the life of one of the apostles. Isn't that amazing? Not one time. He kept them. You say, well, what about Judas? Judas was a devil from the beginning. Jesus knew that. He selected him that, that he might fulfill the role of betraying Jesus, setting in motion God's plan for salvation. I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, notice, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And so even when he talks about lost there, it's not lost as in a failure of his to keep him. Judas is removed from the group because he is the son of destruction. And in the language there, it's the son, the son doomed for destruction. In other words, that was his goal. That was his role. That was his place. Like Pharaoh, God raised up Pharaoh that he might show his power and him and destroy him in front of the Egyptian people. In order that the scripture might be fulfilled. All things, everything traces back to the prophetic utterance. Jesus comes in and fulfills passage after passage after passage to prove that he is who he said he is. And then verse 13 through 17. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled. So he's, he's praying to the Father, but there's, clearly he's aware that the disciples are listening in. I'm coming to you. He's just told them in 16, I'm, I'm leaving. They're all distressed about it. I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I pray, dear God, that, that my leaving, while it's going to hurt them, will ultimately be replaced with a fullness of joy. And I think we can we read through the book of Acts and we say that's exactly what happened. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. In other words, I have poured myself into them, and they are different than they were when I met them, and they are different from their culture. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I think we need to remember that. The goal of the Lord is not to snatch us out when things get hot. The goal of the Lord is to give us the wherewithal to come through the furnace. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. This, this evil, the same evil. But I think, thought that he had won when he, when he convinced, when the devil entered Judas to betray Jesus and when, when the leaders came and took him and beat him mercilessly and nailed him to a cross and he died, I think the devil thought he had won. See, the devil's not, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He knows a lot. He doesn't know everything. Keep them from this evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. That's true of us, folks. We are we're strangers and pilgrims, Peter says. We're passing through. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger passing through this world. I'm bound for the promised land. And then he says in 
verse 17, sanctify them with the truth, your word is truth. The idea of sanctifying, by the way, at it's, its root is to set someone apart. So you, we've been, if you've been saved, you've been taken from the kingdom of darkness, from the kingdom of sin, set apart from and set apart unto. That's, that's sanctification. And sanctification is a, is a continual process. It's ongoing. And the truth applied to our hearts by the Spirit is the means whereby we grow in grace. Sanctify them in the truth. That's why I said this morning. We have an authority, the Bible, and we dare not give up on it. No matter what the culture says or does, how far off the beam it goes, even, even so-called religious people. I find it interesting today I just, just, that one of the candidates went to a Baptist church earlier today and then left there and went to a, an LBGT bar and sees no, no disconnection there. The truth. Your word is truth. Pilate will ask the question, well, what is truth? Well, Jesus answers it here. The word of God is true. Let God be true and everyone a liar. Everyone in culture that lines up against the scripture is a liar. It's not to be trusted. Then verses 18 and 19 is, and you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So I have come in the incarnation and I'm sending them out on incarnational mission. I came to seek and save. I, I, remember, we've talked about this in, in some missional studies we've done. God is the original missional mind. He's the sending God. God so loved the world that he, that he gave. He, he sent his son into the world. The Father and the Son send the Spirit. The Son talks about here of sending his own. You sent me. So I've sent them. We're, we're sent. And for their sake, I consecrate myself in order that they also may be sanctified in the truth. In other words, what I'm doing in my dedication is so that, so that the truth will be imparted to them. I've taught it to them, but now the Spirit will come and empower them and apply it and make, make it effectual in a way it has not been yet. You say, well, but Pastor, he's talking about the eleven here. Oh, look at verse 20 and 21. I do not ask for these only. So in other words, what I've, everything I've asked here is not just for these, these 11, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Guess who shows up in that? That's you and me. Our mother shared the gospel with me. Lord used that to bring me to faith in Christ. Her mother and father shared the gospel with her. And you start tracking it back. Tracking it back. But also for those who will believe in me. It's interesting. I, early on I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Now he's saying, and I pray for everyone who's going to believe through their word. That in order that they may all be one. Now he's brought us into the focus here. We, our unity just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. You know what's interesting? The 11, though they had their issues, you know, who's the greatest and back and forth. But after the, after the resurrection, after Pentecost, we don't, we don't hear of any fighting. The closest thing you come to it is the, is the whole Acts 15 Jerusalem conference where they're confused about whether, a, whether a, a Gentile needs to become a Jew, a proselyte Jew first before he can receive the gospel, they have that big debate. Paul has to dress Peter down at one point because Peter's being inconsistent. But you don't, it's amazing how these 11 have a, have a focused drivenness and a, a unified commitment to advance the gospel. And he's praying that same thing for us. That they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. One of the most powerful evangelistic tools is the unity of a church. A church with a, with a history of 
of fighting and carrying on, is, it, 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 it dulls its witness and it dulls the powerful effect of its witness. Doesn't mean God can't overcome that. He certainly can, but, but it's contrary to what Jesus is praying here for these whom he has poured his life into to become disciple makers and for everyone who will believe through, that, through the centuries witness of them that the world may believe that you have sent me. 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us that love is the key. But I can argue with the greatest philosophers. I can dismantle them. But without love, I just come across as harsh. That's why I said this morning, gospel courage must be a commitment to stand and compassionately share the gospel with a culture that increasingly hates us. Verse 22 and 23, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them. In other words, that John said in the, in the prologue, we beheld his glory. His glory is one uniquely begotten by the Father. Well, he says, I've given them that where, where people will, and it's recorded in the Acts, will take note of them that they've been with Jesus. You have that. I have that I said this morning. The only thing that keeps that from shining forth is our either by neglect of us or by an intentional masking of that light, of hiding that light under a bushel. Otherwise, otherwise, the glory that he has with the Father has been imparted to us by the Spirit, and we reflect that glory of God. The light of the glory of God and the face of Christ has shone into our lives as well. This glory that they may be one even as we are one he's still on this theme of unity I in them and you in me verse 23 in order that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me so now it's you that, that may believe that you sent me may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me so he's He's, there's movement going on here. He's prayed that the Lord not take them out of the world, but that he keep them from the evil one, that they make them one, that this, this powerful unity that they would have would be, a, would be a powerful evangelistic tool that others may come to believe as well. And in verse 24, his, this, this tender heart's desire he has, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me. There's that covenant language again. You gave them to me. They were yours. They're mine. I'm going to give them back to you. That those of you who give me may be with me where I am. What's he praying there? See, he's, he's not contradicting himself. I don't want you to take them out of the world. What's he praying here? That God will keep them, preserve them, that they will persevere so that ultimately when they come to die, and each of these 11 died a martyr's death, that they may be with me where I am. Keep them, Lord, but ultimately deliver them, bring them home. To see my glory that you've given me. We will know as we are known. Now we see through a glass darkly, Paul said Corinthians, but then face to face. Because you loved me before the foundation of the Lord. I want them to be with me and then see the big panoramic picture of your covenant plan. Understand for the first time the depth and width and height and breadth of the love of God shown in Christ Jesus to sinners. Closing his prayer here. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you've sent me. The world doesn't know him. We need to just come to terms with that. And I, I'm guilty of this sometimes of, of the world acting like the world. They don't know him. They think they do, many of them, but they don't. Jesus says, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you. I have this relationship with you. And these know that you've sent me. I've taught them this. And they, they've come to see that, that I'm not just another rabbi. I'm not the latest rabbi on the, on the set uh, suggesting that I've come from God, that I'm the Messiah. They know that I am your Messiah. 
verse 26, I have I made known to them your name. Now, the idea of the name of God is the character of God, not just to be able to pronounce his name, but to know that the name represents his character, that he is holy, that he is almighty, that he is sovereign, that he is merciful. And I will continue to make it known. It's interesting. A couple of options there, I've been reading on this. In the days that he spent with them after the resurrection, he kept teaching and kept teaching and kept teaching. But now, think about that teaching moment. Think about them looking at one who, who had, they knew had died and now has come back from the grave. Think about the impact of that teaching. And then through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, whom he told in John 16, he will come and lead you into all truth. I will continue to make your name known. If you've been a believer any time, length of time at all, you'll, you'll testify that, yes, I, I knew some things, the truth about God, and yet the things he's shown me since then are just amazing. And he hadn't stopped showing me yet. Remember, that's not revelation. That's illumination of, of the revelation that's already there. So I'll continue to make it known. In order that the love with which you've loved me may be in them and I in them. Not just... just what are some themes here? You've given me these people, this covenant language. Glorify me. Glorify them. Help them to love. May the love with which you have loved me be in them. Whew. Think about how the Father loves the Son. And Jesus prays, I want that quality of love, that kind of love, to be their love. To what end? That we would love him. And I in them, he says. And that we would love one another. We said it this morning. That they will see in us our love for the Lord God, for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. That there will be no mistake about that, but that we love him. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. John says in 1 John with almost breathless, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for us. Behold what manner of love the Father has shown to us, John says in 1 John, that we should be called the children of God. And it's fascinating when you look at the original language. Behold what manner of love the Father has shown to us that we should be called the children of God. And then he says, almost with exclamation point, and we are. <laughs> That's what we are. Not just called that. It's not just an identity, it's a reality. He says, oh, Father, I'll continue to make you known to them because the goal is that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. What, is, what does that look like? It looks like it's being conformed to the image of Christ, doesn't it, from Romans 8 increasingly conformed to the image of Christ. Remember, we've talked before, Mark's Gospel teaches this, that we are most conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. When we serve, Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many, and to suffer. Romans 8, we are heirs of Christ, joined heirs with, heirs of God, joined heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we might be glorified together. Serve and suffer, serve and suffer, serve and suffer, serve and suffer. We can't pick suffering, but we can, we can intentionally embrace serving. This is his prayer. It's the high priestly prayer. It's the, he's praying this as he anticipates going to the place where he will not only offer sacrifice, but offer himself as the sacrifice at the high holy time of Passover. And notice how he prays so much for us. And these disciples heard this. I heard him pray this, and I have no doubt that when the Spirit came, he brought a lot of these things to their remembrance. And they, they would, that's why Paul would write to strive to maintain the unity. This word, that word strive in the, in the language of Paul is, it's a, it's a word agonizomai. You hear in that agonize. You don't get, you don't get unity by just skipping along passively, half-heartedly. It's something you agonize over. You, you purposely pour energy into. To what end? That we may love one another and that the world that comes into contact with us may see the love that we have for one another and believe 
both believe and know. He says it two different ways. Believe that God sent Jesus to be the Savior of sinners and know that God sent Jesus to be the Savior of sinners. Having prayed this, he goes across the brook Kidron to Gethsemane. He had finished the work, the work of training the twelve to be disciples, and now was ready to go and finish the other work. Bearing in his body our sin on the tree, and enduring God's wrath for sin, satisfying divine justice by suffering and dying in our place, rising from the grave three days later so that everything he had taught, everything he said, everything he did, had an infallible exclamation point on it. It's done. It is accomplished. Well, let's talk a few minutes before we go. There's not as many of us here tonight, so you're going to have to...